Sorry about the internet, people. Hello, welcome to uh, the uh, tonight's event. Today we have Foz Meadows and Zabe Alor. Hello, you two. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Yes. Um, so for those of you who don't know, uh, Foz is a queer Australian author, essayist, reviewer, and poet. They have won a Hugo Award, a Dittmer Award, and a Norma K. Hemming Award. Their latest novel is A Strange and Stubborn Endurance, which we're here to celebrate. And uh, Zave is the conversation part for tonight. Uh, they just recently had their book come out, their latest book, Silk Fire, their debut in adult sci-fi fantasy. But they are, of course, the author also of The Best Man, May the Best Man Win, and Acting the Part. Um, if you have any questions, you'll notice a link below on the bottom of your screen that says Ask a Question. It looks like we already have one in there already. Good job. And if you haven't yet bought your book, uh, your copy of Strangest of Endurance, or also Silkfire, if you click the link below, uh, you can do that, where you can get the signed copy of both of those tonight. All right, I'm going to go ahead and leave to these authors, and I will see you all later. It's <laughs> all right. <laughs> so I, I always sign these things by. Oh, you get on the focus. So so I, I always sign these things these things by because you know so many times it, it's just nice to get up and have a conversation <laughs> with someone instead of having to be on like a panel where you're just going back and forth and answering questions. Also, it's nice for me personally not to have to look at my own face while I'm talking. <laughs> I've, done, I've done two virtual events with my laptop and I don't have it set up at home at the moment where I can put the laptop on a desk at a reasonable angle because my television is there and that's more important. Um, and it means that the computer is very close to my face and I just have to look at my own face constantly as I'm talking. And it's a very unpleasant and disorienting experience, frankly. <laughs> so this is nice. The camera is all the way over there and I don't have to look at it. <laughs> So I, I think I think things things being where they are. I think you know since we're talking about books, it's always good to just start at the beginning. And so, Fox, can you tell us a little about your inspiration? So, talking about it like as though it had, the, the the set inspiration wasn't me sitting down and planning it because I don't tend to do that. I'm very much a pantser with writing, and I started writing it in 2015 um, because I was between contracts well not between contracts but between the first half and the second half of the contract so I turned in the draft for an accident of stars and I had a sort of grace period where I was waiting for edits and things on that before I began the sequel which is a tyranny of queens and in that brief period where my brain went huzzah I have no commitments um it also went what if we wrote about a closeted nobleman being betrothed in marriage to somebody he doesn't want to marry for closeted reasons and then suddenly I was writing Bellaton's perspective and the book just sort of flowed out of that. So it was very organic and I didn't, I was just literally just pantsing it through like the first 40, 45,000 words um, and making it up as I went. And then I sort of got to a point where I was like, oh, actually I do need to sit down and work out the, uh, the magic and the politics and how everything kind of fits together. And then various things happen. I have to do the other uh, book that I was paid to do and get back to that and so it was sort of like another five years before I got to a point where I could sit down and finish it but um in as much as the inspiration I think it was just me wanting to write something indulgent and tropey uh that I enjoyed <laughs> yeah, and I, th I think that's you know it's so important to talk about the time that goes into right because like, I think especially with with fantasy big chunky books <laughs> so much so much goes into that there's so many rounds They marinate. They marinate, yeah. It's like, because I keep saying that this book was either written in five years or five months, depending on how you measure it, because the actual physical time of sort of two, two and a half month blocks of me sitting down and just going and getting words on paper. But in the middle, it, it, like I was nibbling at it occasionally, 
but I was constantly, it was marinating. It was, it was settling into my consciousness. So when I did come and sit down to write it, it was all there. And I think that's, I think it's so useful, you know, to have, to have that time because we all think, you know, that sometimes it only counts when you're writing, when you're like flat in the chair, fingers on the keyboard, things like typey. Yeah. But that, that thoughtful time. Do th- are there any like particular moments in the book or, or scenes or something that you think is really inspired? Really cool? Um. Okay. So there's probably one, but I can't say what it is for spoiler reasons. <laughs> um. But I think it was more just putting the emotional through line and the political through line threads together in terms of why are people acting and reacting the way that they're doing and for what reason? So when you, the way I do it, because there is a sort of political mystery plot line where you're trying to figure out who the antagonist is or who the antagonists are and where everything is coming from. Um, in my, in my head, I have to know what everybody is doing, even when they're not on the page. Um, so I was talking to other writer friends recently and someone was saying, Oh, they, they know a mystery writer who just, makes it up the whole way through and they don't know who done it until the end and it, it's they're really good <laughs> it's just sort of like oh wouldn't that be nice like it's the way it is i when i sit down to write it if i am just pantsing it and going through i'll still have some kind of notion of who who is responsible and what their motives are and why but the thing that will trip me up is that if I if I'm not physically writing it, I have to be aware. I have to make sort of separate notes to myself about what is happening when those characters are not um, on the page. Because I don't know, I have this weird sort of um, blind spot. If I can't see something, I don't know that it exists. And this applies seemingly equally to characters on the page as it does to food that I have in my house. <laughs> or clothes that I have. Because if they're not on the chair in my bedroom where I discard all of the constantly worn clothes, or if it's not literally on the kitchen bench, um, I forget that I have it and therefore it doesn't exist. So if I don't make notes to myself about what the characters are doing when they're off the page, I sort of, I'll come back to where they're meant to be mentioned again and go, oh shit, what have they been doing? (laughs) So I, yeah, I'm sort of at one of those points at the moment where I keep going to myself, write down it, write it down, write down what they're doing. Cause I'm writing the sequel to this at the moment, which is very exciting. And obviously for spoiler reasons, can't go too much into detail, but there's a particular scene where I'm like, ah, I need to, I need to know for me what happens after the bit that I finished writing. So that when this person shows up again, I have a coherent timeline for where they are and what they've been doing. It would be nice if my brain did that automatically, but alas, no. <laughs> and, and I, I know you Spoilers, but because you know, this is a bit, of, a bit of a romance, and we have yeah. these two men staring at each other completely in the spine. <laughs> oh, I, I, I think it's the same thing. There is some some kissing and feelings and, and love and stuff. Yes. <laughs> yes. So it is uh, primarily a romance. Uh, it, it is what I would call. So, in talking about this in other um, in other contexts, but I think there's an important distinction to be made. Uh, and I'm not, not to say that there is one right answer for this, um, but the distinction between romance as device versus romance as genre. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of overlap there. This I think is more romance as genre because the romance is load bearing, um, narratively speaking. Um, so yeah, the, the sort of elevator pitch is that you've got Bellison, who is from a homophobic nation, comes home, finds himself betrothed in a diplomatic marriage to a girl from the neighboring country of Tithina. Um, his preference for men is revealed in a deeply unpleasant fashion. Um, the solution to the, which is then from the envoy from the neighboring nation, which is much more sexually liberal to say, oh, well, that's fine. You can just marry her brother instead. Uh, and then the unfolding romance between Bellison and Kaithari as they try to sort of figure out how to be married to one another and also who is trying to kill them exactly, or at least to chase Bellison away. So <laughs> that is, that is how the plot unfolds. So what do you think draws you to um, true romance and, and fantasy? You know, there, there's a lot of, it's a fantasy and it's a, a heavy, uh, I, I think we're both, I think we're both not to a good, a, a good love story, especially like when it, when it 
characters who are, who are healing or sort of that healing power of love. But, but I think, so what really drew you to the fight? Okay, so historically, I had a kind of tempestuous relationship with romance. And I've realized as an adult, or I realized a while ago, that actually this was because I dislike Hollywood rom-coms, um, which was the primary exposure to romance that I had, and I think a lot of people have growing up. Um, I didn't like how those romances were structured, but I did love the romances in sort of Shakespeare and Austen and other stuff that I encountered. Um, that way and when I would occasionally read fantasy books that had romance in them like Tamora Pierce and you would get those lovely like romantic narrative through lines you felt deeply invested in it and I realized okay what I what I like about romance is not just when it's when it's happening on its own although that can also be fun but when it is significant to all of these other factors like the, the culture and the plot and the setting so that satisfaction that you get when you're seeing two characters who you independently care about and you independently, if they were just them on their own, you would care about them and want to see what they're doing. When they start to have a romance, then I find that really compelling. But what actually got me to start writing romance was fan fiction. <laughs> so not to be like um, completely basic, but what got me writing fan fiction was supernatural. And obviously, like, well, not obviously, but in hindsight, I wrote fanfic in my tweens and in my teens, which was like for Final Fantasy VIII, and not, yes, eight, not seven, uh, because that is where I came in. Uh, and like sort of Legend of Zelda and things like that. And I would write those stories with friends or for myself. And that was, you know, what you did. And then you sort of got older. And it, at the time, I didn't know that you could keep doing that. So I would just tell stories in my head about the characters that I liked in shows as a way to sort of pass the time on the bus to work or whatever. And then Supernatural became what it was. I was more online and I was like, oh, this is great actually. Now I can I can make up stories and they can be gay and that can be fun. And I hadn't tried writing romance before, but I suddenly discovered that when it was in that context, I was like, oh, I can play with this. I really enjoy this. Uh, and from there it was sort of like a the natural extension of once I'd sort of got my eye in for it using fan fiction uh, to go, oh, I could perhaps make up my own people and make them have a romance. And that would be nice. And so I did. It's it's so incredibly there's something so incredibly about about giving yourself that permission to, to imagine your story, to imagine to imagine setting so transgressive at mm. times. Well, I mean, because invariably the sort of like Hollywood rom com that you grow up with is very, very straight. And that was the thing that was um, useful for me in fan fiction it wasn't just seeing queer romance although that was powerful and it wasn't just seeing the narrative potential explored in stuff that was missing in the canon it was oh here are the list of the tropes that are being used in this in this story and up until then my my knowledge of tropes was sort of slightly secondhand but also from the website tv tropes which i think a lot of people sort of got into well, obviously I knew what the tropes were, but that was how I learned to name them and say, oh, this is what this is, this is what that is. And the problem with that is it can be a great resource, but also it, had, it induced in me this idea that tropes have to be avoided, mm -hmm. that here was this list of all of the cliched writing in the world and these were the things that I had to avoid somehow. And that's a really tangled and unpleasant place to put yourself in creatively because the whole point of tropes is that you can't avoid <laughs> this is these are sort of narrative building blocks and once i realized that um via fan fiction by saying look yes it's enemies to lovers that's on purpose we enjoy enemies to lovers and i sort of snapped out of the the stupid loop that i'd got myself in creatively and went oh shit yeah actually no that is the point i do like that i like when i see it it's not bad that i can identify that i've seen it before i want to see it again um and so it was like I'd sort of been fumbling around with a recipe, trying to recreate a recipe from memory with no idea of what was in it. And then someone just handed me a recipe mm -hmm. with all of the ingredients listed out. Um, and that was, that was helpful <laughs> and enlightening because it suddenly made me realize, oh, actually, it's not specific tropes that I object to. It's the uninquisitive heteronormative way in which they are normally done that pisses me off. And I like so many Hollywood rom-coms 
hinge on two things that deeply irritate me when they're done in that particular way, which is miscommunication and just fully exaggerated, bizarre behavior. Um, like I remember, I have this vivid memory of being, I think 17 or so and going to see this. It was Matthew McConaughey and Kate Hudson in, oh, what was that stupid film called? How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. I, hit, I was in my full teenage, oh, romance is the worst, blah, blah, blah phase. But for some reason, I went with a friend to see that in the cinema. And I came out a sort of gibbering wreck <laughs> because I had seen the trailer. I had seen all the narrative beats in the trailer. And then the movie proceeded to consist of nothing but the narrative beats that had been in the trailer, plus some truly over-the-top bizarrely contrived circumstances but also there were like one or two genuinely good moments in it and that was what was maddening because I'm like you had those two moments you you had this chemistry between the actors and you had the you knew how to construct these moments that felt sort of authentic and compelling and then you did that with the rest of it why why and I just kept on asking myself I kept on walking around going after saying what well, I paid money. I paid money. I paid twenty dollars of my money to see a longer version of the trailer, essentially. Why why did I why? 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 Why did this get I just I was just fully broken by it. And I look back now and it's hilarious, but at the time I was just fully brain static error message, unable to comprehend what had just gone wrong with my life <laughs> that I had done this. You know, I think that's the thing with, with tropes. They can be like, they, they can be a recipe, um, but you know, sometimes you're mixing everything together, and it so much depends on execution. So much on <laughs> Sorry, this is going to seem like a very strange metaphor, but as we're going with the recipe metaphor, there was a TikTok I saw that got put on Twitter yesterday. Someone reacting to some woman who had some, who had never had tea before and she huh. wanted to review it as a drink okay. and she cut the tea bag open and poured the tea into the drink and into the water and was like waiting for it to dissolve and the person who had like duetted this video was just going have you never seen anyone make tea before how what <laughs> like how would you it was it was bizarre it was like a fully grown adult woman doing this and it was like how in a movie or a tv show how have you never seen someone make tea you know now that i think of it i can never actually remember seeing anybody like i can never i can never think of a particular scene that i've actually seen that i know myself but that's the same thing it's like if somebody asks you what's your favorite book suddenly you've never read a book ever in your life and your head is completely empty like What's your favorite book? Don't, don't do that. That's, don't do that to me. Why would you do that to me? <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I get that a lot. It's like, cause people know that you write. And so they say, oh, what's like, what's a really good book? And it's like, just complete blue screen mentally. I've never read a book ever in my life. I mean, when I get that one, I just say, oh, uh, The Broken Heart. Like, like, Which is fantastic. That's one of my favorite. And the more people who read it, the better. So. Yes. Um, the Goblin Emperor, nice. I love by Kathy Anderson, and I love um, Martha Wells's books of the Raxura. I, I will, I like, I love Murderbot, and I love those books. But actually, her entire back catalogue is really fucking good, um, and particularly the books of the Raxura, which are just sort of like, what if queer dragon shapeshifters found family, magical mystery, and a lot of feelings. There's why haven't you told me about these books before now? I, I know that's my thing. Right? I'm very fucking certain that I have. <laughs> you know your dragon shapeshifters are my thing. I know, I know, but uh, I read read the books of the Rexura by Martha okay, Wells. I will. <laughs> I, will I, I will yell at you about them in the car on the way home because you drove me here. So <laughs> prepare yourself for, two, for a two-hour recitation of why these books are really, really good. Um, but they are, you should, but more people should read them. They are truly, truly special. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, 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 
and you know, I think that that brings up something that's that I really love about um, science fiction and fantasy is that you know, so many so many writers have like these great back catalogs. Yeah, so oftentimes like the first, especially an adult, like, you know, the first book you care about is probably not the first book that author has written. So it's always that depth. Now I know you. I know you've written books called other books to try that. How do you think you wrote your previous book? Um, okay, so, how do I put this? There's this quote that Daniel Radcliffe cited um, regarding the Harry Potter films. It's a quote from Gene Simmons, where, who is the, you know, the lead singer of Kiss, where he was asked, you know, all of these year, years later, why do you still wear the makeup? And he's saying, well, because there'll still be, all of these years later, new fans getting into the band and discovering the makeup and thinking that it's cool. And even if I think I've grown out of it, I don't want them to feel like it's wrong for them to enjoy it. Um, and that was sort of Daniel Radcliffe a while ago now talking about how he felt about the Harry Potter films, which I think that might have been before the current context. But that was the context in which I learned about the quote. And it's like, I always say, like, the, the act of writing a book turns you into a person who wouldn't have written it or at least wouldn't have written it quite that way. And so, you know, my first books many moons ago now were young adult sort of vampire novels with a very, very small indie Australian uh, local Melbourne press called Ford Street. And that's a, in, you know, incomplete trilogy basically because the Australian book market crashed uh, around when the second one came out, so the publisher didn't pick up the third one, so it's just the first two books and an incomplete narrative. And particularly with those two, I look back now and it's like there's so much in those books that I would not write the same way now and where I would be actively critical of my past self for having written it the way that, that it is. Because um, we're always our own harshest critics in a certain respect. And so you look back and you go, oh, why did I do that? Why did I do this? Or here's a pothole or here's something I'm dissatisfied with. But I can't diss those books because I know there are still people who enjoy them um, and I don't want to dismiss people who enjoy them or dismiss that enjoyment and also I wouldn't have the opportunity to write this if I hadn't written those first because that was sort of like the first stepping stone where I did that and I got my next agent and I wrote Accent of Stars, Tyrion of Queens and if I hadn't written them I wouldn't have gotten to this point so it is sort of this weird meandering you know, the emotional through line of your professional life, so to speak, <laughs> where you where you end up where you end up. And it you look back and it's a clear path, but when you're doing it at the time, you've got no idea where you're headed. So I think it's just with everything that I've written, I've gotten a little bit better. And that's that's the maddening thing. Like and I don't know if this counts as advice for people who are trying to break into publishing or to get into writing but one of the things the most valuable things that you have to learn and one of the hardest things at times to learn is knowing when to stop um so i have somebody that i knew years ago in a writing group who could never be finished writing their draft because every time they would finish the draft they would realize what the flaws in the draft were and they would want to go all the way back to the beginning and start doing it again and for like over a decade this person has been going over and over and over again with the same book and everyone in the writing group was saying no it's good it's good submit it submit it now and they would go i can't i can't it's not perfect and it's like it's, if somebody accepts it, it's going to be edited anyway and at a certain point you have to let it go you have to cede control over it but that can be really terrifying when you when you're starting out and you want the first thing that you present to be strong and perfect and powerful and but at a certain point you have to you have to let it go you have to put it out in the world to flounder along on its own. It's not. The process is not kind to perfectionists. No. <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. I, I talk, you know, kind of like, to, like author people and, like, film people. I think, like, film creatives are always, like, they're always very used to, like, working with producers. Like, you know, like, oh, we're going to, like, like, I just handled this one aspect of the photography. I just handled this one aspect of the costume. So they have to, they're very good at, like, Having things off, and it's like I am a part of a larger thing, and I've just kind of made my piece of that. And I think, you know, even when you're a writer and you're an editor and a agent and publisher, it's like 
you're very much like you're the one person. Yeah, you're holding it all in your head. And I don't know if you get this. I get this with creative projects, which so the problem is when you, particularly when you're doing something in fantasy or sci-fi, when you have to make up the world and the setting and the magic and all of this stuff as opposed to just things that you know about the, the existing world um your head gets crowded out with all of the different versions of the book that don't make it onto the page or which don't make it to the final version and it gets muddled for me so i'll be like did this end up in the final draft or did was this like two drafts ago that this happened and i feel like it's sort of like a mental burden that i'm carrying of trying to hold the world and all of the things in it in my head and then as soon as it's published, my brain goes, ah, oh, I can put this down now. And I forget everything, <laughs> which is slightly embarrassing because then somebody who will have read the book will not unreasonably assume that you, the author, know what is in the book. <laughs> and it's like, I, I remember the broad outline, <laughs> but a lot of the details, particularly over time, just completely go because, and part of that is, is necessary because otherwise I'd be carrying around 14 different versions of it in my head from all of the different drafts and all of the different what ifs and the things I nearly did but didn't and I have to I have to let it drop out of my my head or it's, it's not even conscious a lot of the time it's just putting it down now mentally so we can pick up the next thing and that's such, that's such a brand skill yeah do you have any idea what you're talking about? We can do yeah, questions? Yeah, Let's do questions. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. It is on AO3. Um, I am slightly. <laughs> uh, I prefer not to say what my AO3 username is in a recorded format, um, but I have said it online before. So if you were to Google, it would not necessarily be hard to find. Let us put it that way, but it does, it does exist. <laughs> um, this is going to be telling on myself, but her comfort. <laughs> uh, I just think nobody nobody gets through life completely emotionally unscathed and a lot of the time we exist in this dichotomy i think i said this in an event yesterday of on the one hand wanting people to perceive what has happened to us and to know what has happened to us and at the same time desperately wanting nobody to know there's that tension because you also and you don't want to explain it because that's vulnerable and difficult and it also means you have to relive it to an extent you just sort of want the world to accommodate you without knowing why it's accommodating you um and that's a really difficult thing to balance in the real world because the real world is difficult whereas in fiction we can say aha here is here is a fictional little man and i have given him problems <laughs> and then the narrative can perceive him we the readers and we the writer can perceive him and we can watch that character be given the catharsis that we perhaps would like to receive in our own lives um and i i just love i love that i just think it's something powerful and it allows you to confront and deal with the terrible shit that goes on in the world um in a sort of safer format than the real world because you can put it in a box and you can close the page or close the window and step away from it need be and you can modulate your emotional response to it but still have the emotional response so you still get to the, the catharsis at the end uh thank you very much firstly i'm glad you enjoyed it um and the answer to that is yes um i am actively writing a sequel at the moment um i can't say much about it for spoiler reasons but basically it is the protagonists again kakari and Bellison, and well 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 if it isn't the wider political consequences of the first book um and we're in this relationship so how do we make it work now while other stuff is still going on and while there are now 
uh, more emotional connections and more emotional consequences from the first book that we both have to live and deal with. So I'm sort of like a bit over midway through that, I think, at the moment. But, um, or a bit more, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, I have like a, where I'm up to in the draft at the moment, I have, from that point onwards, I have a sort of scene by scene breakdown of what's coming next. But even when I have that sort of breakdown, I'm very, very bad at telling <laughs> how much writing that will actually translate to. Um, but I know what, I know where it's going. So. <laughs> most challenging part I think so this is again slightly telling on myself um, the point where I realized that the setting did need magic to work because the original the very original draft that I just pantsed my way through the first you know 40 odd K of um, I had this notion that there should be magic in there at some point but I was so uh, caught up in the emotional through line that I didn't include it early on. I just sort of thought, oh, I'll go back and put that in later and and figure out how it works. And then I sort of got stumped at a point and, re and I was sitting there going, why can't I, why can't I figure it out? And it was because the world building was incomplete and I needed to know how the magic worked and how it fit into the setting. And by that point it was sort of like, oh, okay. Um, I, I need these rules and I need to synthesize it narratively. I need to make these things fit. And that was the more complex bit to go back and sort of impose because I've never done that before. Normally when I'm normally when I'm writing something, the world building is what I'm most concerned with. I'll have like I'll pants the plot and I'll carry the characterization in my head, but I will have like a detailed world building document of here is language and food and customs and calendar and all of this kind of stuff. Um, but I hadn't I was just so caught up with the characters that I hadn't quite done that on this occasion. So it was, I just deferred one whole element of the world building till a later point. And then the later point came and I was like, oh, this is harder now. <laughs> now, if I haven't, because I haven't wound it in from the beginning, I have to go back and wind it in. And that was more difficult than if I'd just taken five minutes at the beginning to work it out. But if I'd done that, I might've lost the emotional momentum that, I've been going through, so who knows? <laughs> um, yes and no. The there's a longer version of this story which I won't tell um, because it is very long. But basically, uh, the way that this book came to be published is uh, I had a bad experience with my previous agency. Um, we parted ways, I was unrepresented. And then in 2020, uh, something happened which prompted me to talk online about the experience that I had had. And that was in part related to not just the pandemic, but wider political goings on. Um, so I don't know if I can contribute that to the pandemic specifically, but it was in sort of 2020 with all of the stuff that was going on, it became relevant to say uh, what had happened to me. And that was how the, my current agent ended up reaching out to me and offering representation. And that was having, once I had that representation, I was like, well, I definitely need to give her a book to, to shop around for me. Uh, so I raced to finish that book now that I had the sort of uh, momentum and uh, incentive uh, so that, yeah, so it didn't, but also it was just like the past couple of years have been weird, hard, <laughs> very difficult. A lot has gone on in the past couple of years um, and they haven't impacted like the narrative of the book or, um, you know, changed when it was going to be released. But in terms of as an environment, being an environment to write in and to try and get stuff done in, that has been um, for me, as I suspect for most of us, challenging. <laughs> Do you want to go first? Oh god, I just I have like a little bag of uh, Trader Joe's unsalted peanuts. <laughs> 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 
they're like a little protein. Um, I tend to, I've, I've discovered recently that I drink more water if I drink carbonated water, if I drink soda water. Um, so I'll usually have like a Salil or something next to me uh, as I drink. I don't tend to snack as I work though, unless, unless I'm stuck. If I'm stuck, then I'll go and get a snack. And that usually means I'm about to flip over to YouTube or some other streaming thing and be like, mm, I'll just watch something while I have my snack. And then two hours passes and I haven't done anything. Um, but I do tend to have like constant cans of soda water lined up next to me um, in my study, which is a problem actually, because I only have a little table. I, I work on a bed because I don't do well sitting upright for long periods of time. Um, so I've got like a little table next to me with my mouse and uh, things on it. And if I'm lazy, which I being a gremlin often am, <laughs> the table will suddenly start to fill up with empty cans. It, like there's a bin over there. I can put them in the bin, but sometimes the bin will get full and I don't empty it again because I'm a lazy gremlin and the cans will just start to accrue on the side table. And it'll get to this point where I can't put my arm there to use the mouse. And um, that's, that's always a slightly shameful moment. <laughs> Mm, no. <laughs> short, an short answer, no. Uh, but perhaps in the future, I don't know. I think the way my brain works with narrative ideas is I don't always know where everything comes from. I'll get like a little what if that'll occur to me and it sort of goes in the room, the mental room with all of the other what ifs until there's some sort of like mental static cling that clumps a bunch of different ideas together and then they sort of rise up to the top and go, hello, we are a, context, a context and a concept, um, and I'll start writing it. But I don't always necessarily know where an idea comes from or, like, where a particular bit of an idea comes from. Um, but my brain is very compartmentalized with this. Like, so every time I get stuck, every single time I get stuck, I am convinced that I've just lost the ability to write and I can't, <laughs> I can't do this anymore. And 99 times out of 100, it's just some subconscious process that is more aware of where the story is going than my conscious brain going, you're doing it wrong. You're going in the wrong direction. This isn't working somehow. And you're sitting there going like, why? Why can't you just, why can't my subconscious brain just tell me what the issue is that I'm having? And it just goes, nope, wrong. I just have to then go away and do something else for a day or an hour or a week until something clicks over and you go, oh, this character needed to come in here. Or, oh, that was the wrong conversation. Or, oh, this scene should have ended several chapters earlier. Or whatever it is, you just need to, to work through it. But it's deeply irritating because every single time I think I've broken something in myself and then it's just like, no, no, the little gremlin in the back mental office is just holding up, like sitting there on its phone while holding up a red flag. To whatever I'm doing, but without explaining itself. <laughs> Brains are weird. I, I, I don't, so I, without wanting to criticize the question, that's not kind of how I conceive of it. So I think it's like my base level at the moment is wanting to tell queer stories as a queer person. And I think I Okay, how do I explain this? There was a point about, let's say 10 years ago or 12 years ago now, when I first started to become aware of um, sort of diverse fiction and diversity in fiction and the importance of uh, representation and storytelling. And I sort of immersed myself in um, a lot of the essays and discourse and everything that was being written at the time. And this is going to seem like a weird thing to say, but something sort of, there was like a, a, to me, a discernible mental shift where I went from conceiving of certain types of identity or um, certain narrative options uh, from an external perspective as in, oh, this is something I have to consciously think of to write. 
and where my brain just sort of went, no, 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 the full range of human experience is now available to us as a thing to potentially write about. Um, which doesn't mean I'm qualified necessarily to write about all of those experiences and there's some that I wouldn't attempt because that's not my lane. Um, but it wasn't something I did consciously. It was just the more I read and the more aware I became of that, something in me sort of went, oh, great. Like it was, it was like sort of, like one of those video game screens where you have to unlock various characters. And when you start out playing the game, you know, you can see like the little shadows where the, where the as yet unlocked characters will stand in the selection menu. And then there's just you. And it was like having that suddenly sort of light up. You go, ah, oh, yes, here are other people that I can write about as well. And that's, that's, I'm not explaining this properly, but the thing that I noticed at the time was suddenly uh, my dreams changed and I started having more types of person in my dream and more scenarios in my dream. It was like, I, again, I'm not explaining this properly, but <laughs> it was sort of like just knowing that something bigger than you existed and that there were more possibilities than you had sort of grown up thinking that there were narratively. And it was, ah, oh, yes, I can see all of this now. And something in me has shifted so that now when my brain is randomly tossing up ideas for what a character could be or who a character could be, it sort of natively gives me more options than it did once upon a time without me having to hunt down those options. Um, and it's hard to kind of articulate as a shift, but I think it's, I think it's an important distinction to make between looking at identities from an external perspective as something you have to, you have to consciously make yourself think about and say, ah, yes, this time I'm going to write about a blind character or this time I'm going to write about a trans character or whatever, as opposed to your brain just natively suggesting those as options when you're thinking, okay, I've introduced this new character and, and then your brain just goes, and X or X and Y. Um, but yeah, I apologize because I've answered that terribly and explained it terribly. <laughs> it's, it's a weird sort of mental process to try and explain in the first place. Um, <laughs> You want to go first? Yeah, so I've been reading, I've read a lot of the great events of Nevermore right now, and you're talking about it. Uh, earlier, I was saying one of the things that I, I really love is the book written for children, sort of the way that children see the world as wonderful and like whimsical and frightening things. remember what it's like to be a college student. <laughs> War flashbacks. Um, so at the moment, uh, I'm reading Fevered Star by Rebecca Rowanhorse, which is the second book uh, in the Earth and Sky, I think, trilogy, because um, I just read Black Sun. I've had Black Sun, which is the first book, seri book in the series, on my shelf for ages, but my TBR shelf at this point is actually like four shelves and uh, they are embarrassingly full. So, and I, but I, I keep buying more books because that's who I am as a person. Um, but I finally got to Black Sun and it was so, so good. It's just really, really good epic fantasy, which feels intimate despite the epic scope because it's so heavily rooted uh, in characterization and it's so cleanly and tightly written that it's giving you this sort of really big, really intricate, um, beautifully realized world um, and you're just perceiving it and experiencing it through the characters. So I'm really enjoying that. Um, and also I've been getting the new, um, the new volumes that have been coming out for the English translations of Moshan Kongshu's novels. So the, I've picked up today the new edition or the new volume of Scum Villain's Self-Saving System. And I just read the, um, the new one of Heaven Official's Blessing. I just, I love her writing and I love those books so much because they're apart from just being like funny and angsty and pleasing they are just devastatingly intelligent um 
and prescient in terms of their politics and their understanding of human nature and cycles of history and cycles of violence and all of the details in them, the amount of the depth of thematic or just about, like everything, the depth of the themes and the richness of the texts that she manages to convey, where that you can just look at it as this one simple level of here is a story about, you know, these two people and the people around them, and then the the ways that you can read into them and the analysis of what she's doing at all of the different levels is just breathtaking the deeper in it goes. And I'm just every time I get to read a new one, it like a new bit of the story, it's immensely joyful. 